פרופסור רני צריד, רוני צריד, who is the dean of the uh, school of graduate study, או advanced studies, story, רוני, I always get mixed up with you. your title, graduate study, um, to say a few words of opening, so thank you, Rony, for joining us. Oh, sorry, Rony, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simcha. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning to our speaker and uh, all our guests. And we welcome you to this gathering on open access. And I will start by a famous quote from Sir Isaac Newton, who's, which says, if I was able to see a little farther, it's because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. Or in Hebrew, <laughs> The quote highlights that any individual's achievements are not just the results of their own effort, but are also built upon knowledge and collective effort over time. And open science offers such knowledge, collaborations and cooperations towards enhancing our abilities. In fact, open science breaks down barriers that prevent scientists and the public from accessing scientific knowledge and thus helps increasing the visibility, reliability, and impact of the research. It makes research more transparent, accessible, and reproducible, which in turn promote scientific accuracy and progress. I thank and acknowledge Dr. Simcha Meir and the excellent team from the libraries and information system led by Dr. Olga Goldin, who organized the Open Access Week at Bar Ilan University and work hard continuously in an effort to convince and promote the awareness of our students and faculty members to open access. I'm sure we will obtain insights from the speakers and the lectures that will be presented uh, during the open access week and wish all of you an interesting and stimulating event. And thank you. Let thank you, speak Renee. Next speaker. I like your phrase. Um, so now it's a pleasure for me to introduce Garrett O'Neill. He is a principal consultant on open science technologies group, specializing on open science and the European Open Science Cloud. He has a research background in theoretical linguistic and has represented researchers at the policy level, including a president of the European Council for doctoral candidate and junior researcher. Garrett is an ambassador for Plan S under Coalition S, is a, he is a work package leader on policy and strategy in, op, uh, in the EOSC Future Project, where he is also a coordinating of the EOSC Observatory and work package leader on developing indicator and metrics for open science in Opus Project. Well, there are a, a few words here that probably part of the audience does not understand. Uh, so I hope you'll elaborate on part of them. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation as well. Let me first see if I can share my screen. Can you see this? Yeah. And what you should see is a, uh, I guess, a QR code and a bit.ly link down on the bottom right. So I'll leave this for, I don't know, 20 seconds um, if you want to take a quick screen grab there or grab the slides, uh, then you can see exactly what I'm, I'm looking through. There's also links in the slides, so that might be useful. So I'll just give that a second. While you're taking a, a picture there, um, please do feel free to interrupt uh, by raising your hand or just open your microphone if you have any questions, comments, uh, or if you have something to say. I'm very happy if you uh, interrupt me because I will just keep talking until otherwise. So let's not wait till the end for questions. Just please raise your hand uh, or open up your microphone and shout out if you've got something to say. Okay, let's jump right into this. Um, I've, I'm being very ambitious with the slides here. I'm guessing I'm not gonna get through them all. So let's pick out at least some of the main activities related to open science. And let's start with a bit of background. So um, open science is something that we've probably been doing uh, for many, many centuries. Uh, we've been opening up to some extent uh, our research uh, going back certainly a couple of thousand years, uh, be that through manuscripts or papyrus, uh, and now through the digital medium. 
Um, but really in Europe, this, this took off around 2016 uh, when the European Commission decided to more formalize their approach towards open science. And their approach was kind of threefold. It's, it's fizzled out a little bit, but essentially they, had, they wanted to separate three different things. So they had one aspect of this called open innovation that was basically to pull more stakeholders into the innovation process with a more focus on uh, science and technology in academia and in industry. So moving, let's say, a bit outside of academia. Open science then was a way to facilitate this by opening up the research itself through digital tools. So for them, open science focused on the actual opening up of research activities, research outputs, research collaboration. And their final concept was open to the world. So how can we use science to uh, improve the lives of citizens? And how can we essentially not just looking within Europe, but open up uh, with other actors across the world? Just to note, by the way, that this year, I believe, is the year of open science in the United States. So we should be hearing about that a lot more. Now, open science means a lot of things to many people. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. I will just note some of the practices and the names differ depending on who you ask. But we have essentially, from my perspective, some of the main practices are open access to research publications. It's mostly what you'll hear about when you hear about open science. Then we have open data or fair data, which I'll come back to in a bit. We have open peer review, so opening up the review process for publications. We have open source software, so opening up software code linked to research. We have open licensing, so how you let people know what they can do with your outputs, for instance, in the top right hand corner of my slides here, you'll see I have a CC BY license that tells you that you can do anything you want with my slides. You just need to reference me uh, when you are using them or, or, or promoting them elsewhere. And there's also citizen science. If we have time, we might touch that at the end. Now, why should we do open science? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure many people will have arguments for and against. In any case, for it opens up access to research. By opening up the access to research, it increases the discoverability of your own research results. In other words, people can find it and they can use it. Uh, if it's opened up, it means it supports reproducibility. So if you make a claim, for instance, in a publication, I need to be able to check that claim. And if you open up the data set, I can actually check the data to see how you got to your conclusion and if it stands up. So this is really a heavy part for increasing reproducibility. We know that there has been several crises in science over the last decade, particularly in psychology, for instance. And one of the reasons here is how to reproduce uh, the science that is published. So open science is one of the ways to do that. By opening up your research results, it of course increases the impact both of the research so others can use it and it speeds up, of course, science and innovation, but critically also for the researcher themselves, it increases their own social impact. If I open up my research outputs and you can link to it, uh, then you can build upon what I've done and I can be ultimately rewarded for it, potentially at my university or, for instance, uh, in a funding grant. Now, another part of this is that for those countries or institutions which perhaps do not have a large budget to build machines or to develop particular research, it helps to share and save resources. So by pooling resources, by sharing the outputs, others can benefit from it. You may not be able to uh, participate, for instance, in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, but if they open up their data, then critically you can actually build on the science, you can build on the results that they have. It means you don't have to build a billion dollar uh, Hadron Collider or support or maintain it over the years. So you can actually still benefit even though you've not paid into it. And maybe one just last point here when we talk about open is that the aim is to be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. What that means is, is that open and closed are not uh, black and whites. There is a gradient somewhere in between, and it's up to the researcher, potentially also their supervisor, but certainly the collaborators to decide where on the spectrum of openness their research results should fall. Uh, if I give an example, uh, not everything should be open. For instance, uh, research that involves biomedical data, intelligence data, military data, potentially sensitive data should perhaps never be opened. Uh, and there's no issue with that. It's to make sure that you at least identify what is and what isn't open. Also, uh, technologies that could be used for dual use so that on the one hand, they seem to have a public use, but on the other hand, could potentially be used 
for other purposes, such as military purposes. Um, but this this does need to be keep an eye on, and we'll see as we come back a bit later why that is relevant. So we try to be as open as possible, uh, as closed as necessary. We're not pushing for extreme open uh, or extreme closed. We have to somewhere find a gradient in between. Now, what kicked a lot of this off on open science was uh, linked to open access to research publications, or rather closed publications. So as the title of this article in The Guardian from several years ago might indicate, is the staggeringly profitable business of scientific publishing bad for science? And I think you can already notice from the title that the answer is yes. Uh, the staggeringly profitable business of scientific publishing has in some respects been good for science, but in other respects, it's been quite bad for both science and for scientists. I'll leave you to read that article. What I will do is sketch a little bit how that looks at the moment and what essentially uh, the open science movement is trying to move towards. So what we have typically at the moment is a closed in a way versus an open uh, publishing system, read and publish system. Now, traditionally how that worked was that uh, university libraries, particularly research libraries would pay for subscriptions to specific journals, usually bundled. And what that means is that if you're a member of that uh, institution or you're a researcher or a student at that institution, then you gain access to the journals, to the articles that that institution has paid for. So it's a closed form of access strictly for those who have paid. That means that if you are not a member of that institution or not a student or a researcher there, uh, then you simply don't have access to those articles and you must pay. And that's the infamous paywall that many people will get when they click an article and it says, yes, you can have the article, but now you must pay anywhere between, I guess, five to 25 to 50 to even a hundred dollars uh, for an article, depending on the field and depending on its importance. Now, the move away from that is towards what we'd call a more open, fair system. And the idea there is that there is free access for all to both read and to publish. Now, note, I do not mean that it does not cost anything. It always costs money. What we mean strictly here is that everybody can read and access scientific literature, especially given that this in many cases is coming from the taxpayer. So the taxpayer is paying for science, is paying for scientists to publish their articles, and then in a perverse switch, they end up having to pay back to get access to the science that they do uh, through institutional subscriptions. So the idea here of open access is that a, a version is typically deposited, a version of the article, usually not the final version, is deposited in the in an institutional repository, could also be an online repository, where you essentially have access to a pre-final version, or in many cases, you have access to the actual final version in the journal itself online. So this is this distinction that we seem to have at the moment between closed versus open publishing. Now, some of the key issues that you will hear about in open access, and especially what is being discussed now in Europe, um, are some of the dichotomies that you see on the screen here. So we have, first of all, a distinction between full versus hybrid journals. A full open access journal means that all articles in that journal are by nature open. You can access them. You don't have to pay. There is no paywall. They are not closed. A hybrid journal is essentially a journal that has a mixed model. Some articles in there will be open and some articles in there will be closed. Now, the reason for these hybrid journals was to try and uh, push publishers towards opening up everything. Uh, but we seem to have somehow gotten lost in the translation and many, many hybrid journals have appeared in the meantime, but have not transitioned to full open access. So that is a problem that funders in Europe are now facing. A second one is on when the publication itself is actually opened. We have immediate versus delayed. So immediate is essentially the moment it has been accepted and is ready to be published. It goes online, it's open access immediately. Delayed open access is typically where an article is closed for a duration of time, usually six months, 12 months, or 24 months, where the publisher is able to recoup costs through subscriptions, and then after a particular time period, the article becomes open. So this is what we call delayed open access. And the sole argument for that is that publishers can make um, some profit return on their costs before they open this up to the public. Now, another issue is on copyright and licensing. In many cases, researchers will hand over, sometimes even against the, uh, the mandate of the institution, 
they will hand over their copyright ownership of a particular publication or images in the publication or data set um, and essentially pass it to the publisher for many, many reasons. They, they, there's usually a list of why you should do this. Effectively, whoever owns the article or the image or the publication uh, or the data set um, determines the license, so how it is shared. So as I said here, I've shared freely um, and openly these slides. Now, a, a perverse example of this is a researcher who signed over the copyright of a publication to uh, a publisher I won't name, and then they wanted to use an image in that article for their own PhD dissertation. And so they informed the publisher, uh, I, I need to use this image, so hereby letting you know, and the publisher said, no problem, that will cost you 2,000 euros. Uh, so the researcher said, no, I'm afraid this is my article, I'm just informing you. They said, no, no, you transferred copyright of the article, meaning everything that's in there, meaning you also transferred copyright of the images that you have in the article. And if you want to reproduce those images, you must pay us a fee, given that we are the copyright owner. So that's an extreme example of effects that have not been seen where ownership of an article and an image in this case was transferred to the copy uh, to, to the publisher, um, which caused problems for the researchers themselves down the line. Now, a couple of other colors you'll hear, I'm not gonna go into all the colors, are the different colors of open access publishing. You have green, you have gold, you have diamond, you have bronze, uh, you have silver. I think there's a, a few other colors thrown in there, but basically what these colors refer to is the form of openness or the model, business model. So green open access basically means you take a version of the article and you deposit it in an institutional repository. So everybody can find it in the library, for instance. Gold open access typically means that the article is opened immediately online by the publisher. It has come to mean that you also pay for this, a so-called APC, article processing charge, but basically it means the full final version is published by the journal online. And diamond publishing, which you'll hear a lot about, is basically uh, the model itself. So we're not interested in the model as a researcher, but what diamond means is that you do not pay to read an article, you also do not pay to publish an article. So for the researcher, it is free to both read and to publish. And there's a strong movement now towards uh, creating more diamond journals or transferring some of these other more closed journals towards diamond. Now, I think the last point in this discussion is um, why this model has been kept. And one of the reasons for that is that the journals have essentially become gatekeepers to scientific excellence and scientific evaluation. So we have what is called the journal impact factor, the GIF, the GIF, um, or the brand of the journal. And this basically means that researchers within specific fields will know their top journals or the prestigious journals. And that's exactly where they will publish. And they will publish there because it's a recognized journal in their field and because the impact factor is relatively high. And this is of course important for their own evaluation when they go to their institution to either uh, for instance, climb in the ladder, so get a better position, or go to a new university and get another position, or apply for research funding. One of the key ways researchers are evaluated is on the number of publications that they have in high impact factor, uh, somewhat prestigious journals, and the citations that they have linked to that. So this is, the, in a nutshell, I think, some of the key issues in open access, uh, some of the key topics I'm guessing you'll hear a bit more about this now during the Open Science Week. Um, and maybe just to give you an example of, of a push back against um, the system as it is now in place is a movement called Coalition S who have put forward a proposal called Plan S. And a disclaimer, I'm one of their ambassadors. Now, Plan S was essentially uh, a movement set up several years ago by funding a national funding bodies in Europe and beyond um, to somehow take back control of how they are spending their money. So not necessarily how much they're spending, but rather how they are spending their money. So the idea behind this was a set of 10 principles uh, forming this Plan S, and the research funders who sign up to this basically demand from their researchers, because they're paying their researchers, so they must comply, uh, and by extension, exerting an influence on the publishers, that all research articles from their funding uh, money is both published in full open access journals, so no more hybrid, all uh, only journals where every article is open, 
and that the article is immediately available. So no more delay in publishing. Now, the reason for this, of course, was that the funders are paying millions of euros into science and for publishing. And so they want now a say in how and when those uh, research results are made available. So the idea is that they want those research results immediately available and open to everybody to be able to access and read. There's some other issues they put in there, which I've referenced. They demand that the author and or the institution, depending on the, the agreement, keeps the intellectual property or ownership of the publication and the data. And thus they get to determine the license. And they also request that you use an open license similar to what I've used on the slides here. So either a CC by license or some other restrictions such as in the humanities on commercialization and translation. And here they demand that this is either what's called the author accepted manuscript. So the version of the article that has been peer reviewed but not finalized or the version of record, which is the actual final, final version of the article. So this is Plan S in Europe. I believe, I do not believe that the Israeli funder is um, a part of Plan S. I guess it is possible in the future, but what this means critically in Europe is that if you apply for a research grant under any of these funders, you must comply with these uh, requirements. So you must publish an open access. It must be immediate. You must keep copyright. You must use an open license. Uh, and there's a couple of other factors in there that you can read about uh, in the link. And just to note for those of you in uh, either interested in or already involved in European Commission projects, the European Commission is now aligning with several of these principles in Plan S. So we see that there's a huge push now in Europe towards opening up access to research publications uh, and by extension also to data, which I'll come to in a moment. Before I jump on to open peer review, I just check, are there any questions or comments um, before I go on? And if you do raise your hand or just shout out, please. I have a question. Here. Plan S, it's really exchanging one payment with the other. If we, in hybrid journals, we have to pay to the journal and in open access journals, we pay APC. So it's the yeah. same, but so, the payment yeah. now is on, on the researcher in both cases, really. So, so maybe first thing difference? to say, it's never on the researcher. The researcher never pays or never should pay. It is always on the institution or the funder. So money from this should be coming from the institution funder or potentially government. Now, what Plan S uh, didn't do, and in a way wasn't revolutionary, was it did not try to tackle the actual uh, money issue itself. So we know that we spend around 10 billion uh, euros per year on scientific publishing and getting access to scientific publishing, right? There are, aside from the article processing charges, which are paid on individual articles, there are of course major agreements between publishers and universities or collections of universities um, where millions of euros are traded for gaining access to articles and for publishing, right? That Plan S has not tried to tackle that. There is a separate initiative for that. It's called Open Access 2020. You can see they've already surpassed the date. They're still not there. Um, now, there they are trying to take control, let's say, of the amounts of money that are being uh, uh, paid into the mega publishers, right? There's about five major publishers that dominate the market here. There really are only about five or six that dominate. So Plan S, what it's done is try to essentially control some of the conditions that they set when they pay, but the, the model itself has not really changed. The money is still flowing straight to publishers to a large extent um, where they set the prices, right? Some, some institutions or some funders have set caps so, for instance, in Austria, they've set a cap on APCs of 2,500, um, but that's only Austria. Now, to come back to the point on how should we spend the money, if we were to translate immediately from uh, the agreement system we have in place with the libraries, right, and just focus on paying for gold open access, we know that this would probably cost around five, six billion euros per year, meaning that if we shifted simply to an APC model, for gold open access, we would already cut the cost by half. I'm not advocating for that, by the way, because I think it would need to yet even more perverse effects, but it's just to note that by switching to an APC system, we would already reduce it by around a half um, of the costs. 
it's much more complicated than that, unfortunately. And I think that's one of the reasons why Plan S has not immediately tried to tackle it. They've been much more pragmatic and focus on if we pay this amount of money, this is what we want. I see another hand raised. Yes, please. Uh, would it be possible to set up um, rivalry government funded uh, publishers? Because if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, there used to be Oxford University Press that was run by the university. Now it's a separate business. But it used to be all the press used to be within the universities and rewarded the researchers with a promotion for publishing within this uh, university government funded system. Right. And these don't even have to be diamond models. They can also charge. Right. Let me let me give um, a couple of examples. So that already exists. Um, in, within the field of linguistics, one of my, my former colleagues in Leiden and current executive director of Plan S is a gentleman called Johan Rorijk, uh, a theoretical linguist. Now, Johan used to be the editor in chief of a linguistics journal, a very popular high impact factor journal called Lingua, uh, owned by Elsevier. And Johan, for many years, and I remember this at the time in Leiden, um, was fighting with Elsevier to gain ownership of the journal and to make the journal more fair in terms of the prices they were charging and the processes in place. And Elsevier essentially rejected this. As a consequence, in a, in a form of a coup d'etat, uh, <laughs> Johan and 32 of the editorial staff, the entire staff, resigned on the 31st of December, I think it was 2015, and immediately after midnight, set up a new journal called Glossa. And they took the entire editorial team to Glossa, it was a, a journal now owned by the editorial board. So the researchers themselves owned it and they set this journal up. Now, the problem they faced immediately, of course, was backlash from Elsevier. It got very nasty publicly. Secondly, they have no indexing or impact factor because it's a new journal that takes at least three years. So they knew that by setting this up, they would potentially uh, could kill the journal because they had no indexing or impact, right? However, what they did have was the research community, the linguists, particularly who supported the journal for years. The entire community ignored Lingua and automatically shifted to Glossa. Now, the effect is that now Glossa is indexed. It's got a high impact factor and it's progressing. It's not free. It charges article processing charges, but under what they consider fair. So I think the processing charges are somewhere between 500 to 1,000 euros, depending. Um, and and they, they also will sign waivers for those from so-called third world countries or researchers who have a reason why they cannot pay. So, so in a way that's saying what you're, that they, they did, they practice this themselves, but the problem is this is a limited uh, example. Journals have not switched in general to that model. Researchers generally have not said no against their publishers and uh, created their own models. So unfortunately the, the, this was one of but a few who have managed to do that. It has not spiraled out. The second thing is there already exists many government initiatives to set up uh, journals. In Croatia, for instance, many of the journals there are funded directly by the state and they're diamond open access venues. And this is the intention here, of course, is that uh, Croatian researchers can publish in these journals. But the problem always comes back to impact factor and brand or prestigiousness. Uh, so, yes, you can publish in a diamond open access journal, but if it does not have a high impact or, or any, you're not getting rewarded in your career progression or your grant applications. So it's stuck in a, a circle, a cycle of to get recognized in your field, you must publish in a high impact factor journal. A high impact factor journal is typically already owned by a, a major publisher. Not always. There are some societies who have some bad practices. I won't name them. Um, and you never really get out of that circle of impact factor. So that's the problem. So yes, moving towards open infrastructure is definitely the way. I would definitely support such a move. It would in the long run cost us probably half, if not a third of the amount that we're now spending. Um, but, but that's not happening. And just to note, the problem is not commercial publishers per se or commerciality. The problem is a market dominance by five publishers, Elsevier, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis, Wiley and Sage, and the fact that they can set prices and dominate and control scientific uh, excellence. So this is the problem that we're facing. I see another question. Yes, hi, hello. 
Um, my name is Mary. I'm, I'm a PhD candidate in the comparative literature department. I actually wanted to ask about the impact factor because it's, it's for me, it's confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. On one hand, I want to participate in the open access and I believe in it. And on the other hand, I'm not sure about how it affects impact factor, especially for, um, you know, a, a PhD candidates that need uh, yeah. this. Yeah, but you actually, you kind of answered. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if you have more to, to add to what you said. I do. So let me say two things. The first one is, um, what is the impact factor? The impact factor was set up as a way for university libraries to understand what are journals they should gain access to and buy subscriptions for their researchers. Because of course, universities have limited budgets. They can't afford to buy access to all journals. So it was essentially a popularity quiz on what articles or what, what journals should I buy for my researchers? If, if, if my university focuses on linguistics, we should probably be only buying linguistics, literature, and so forth uh, journals, right? So it was a way to figure out what should I spend my money on? The sad reality is that it has become a de facto metric for excellence. So not for what is popular, but rather what is excellent. In other words, the higher the impact factor, the more popular it is, sure, but critically, the better it is. There's nobody that will uh, refuse to publish in Nature closed access. I have a colleague in uh, in Austria. She won't mind me sharing this. In to her own, it in her own words, she was a mediocre scientist um, who was struggling to get a fixed position, and then she published an article in Nature in biochemistry. Within one year. She had a fixed tenure position at a top institution in, uh, in Austria. She then went on to gain an ERC grant, a highly prestigious grant within uh, Europe from the European Commission. She then was nominated into an Academy of Science in the same country, and a string of incredible achievements followed within a short duration. And she's very clear, this all came down to one thing, one publication in Nature made her career and made her future life uh, one publication so with that amount of power you can see how publishers and how top journals have a say in science one journal essentially made her career had she not published there who knows where she would have been but she is very clear she would not have ended up where she is now in all of these high ranking positions right the second thing is um what do you do as a researcher when you want to publish open access let me give a very specific example. So what I do is I, I'm an ambassador for Plan S, so of course I should abide by it, and I do. So let's say I want to publish an article. I have an article now I should get out. Now what I do is, first of all, I go to uh, a journal tracker. There are, there are you know, there are way, I'll rephrase this. There are sites you can go to check on uh, whether it's open access and other criteria, right? One of them is the Directory of Open Access Journals, the DOAJ. There's also one for monographs. It's the Directory of Open Access Books, but in principle, I go to the DOAJ and I click essentially the criteria for Plan S. So immediate open access, no hybrid. Uh, I can keep CC BY, um, I keep ownership and so forth, right? And it gives me a list of articles. So let's say I get, for argument's sake, 20, 20 journals in my field of mm. linguistics. What I then do is I deselect for diamond, no cost, because I don't want to charge the taxpayer anything. What I end up with is like three articles that are or three journals that are basically, in my view, not good. Right. So now I have to make a decision. I'm willing to pay an APC, but I have a preference myself for fair APC. So I don't want to pay more than 750 euros per article. I can. I'll be supported by the funder up to several thousand euros, but I refuse personally to pay it. So I delimit the APC range from zero to 750, right? Now I get a list of maybe five to 10 journals. And then I deselect the journals based on the editor, editorial board, my knowledge of the journal itself, colleagues perhaps who have printed there, and I make a selection. Now, my problem at the moment is that cuts me down to around three or four journals I can print in. So of course, that's a bit restricted. Uh, what do I do when I publish in all three? Typically, they're not going to let you back in quickly, right? 
So, so you have at the moment a real problem there uh, when you set your, your, your lines on what you're willing to pay and what you want. So what I would say is that it's definitely possible to pick an open access venue. If you have the funding, of course, you can publish there. APCs can go up to two and a half thousand euros typically, if not four in some particular cases or five for nature. But if you want to set your range lower, you have to be willing, I think, as a researcher to stand by your own moral uh, guideline or moral compass, right? I am, um, but maybe not everybody is. So, so that's, that's a decision I think that I would leave to the researcher and the funder. If there's a mandate there by the funder, you've no choice, you must comply. If you have uh, room for maneuver, then you, you go down as much as possible. Open access, following particular criteria and trying to pay as less as possible into that system. I don't know if that answered your question. It does, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm just keeping an eye on time. So I'm gonna uh, jump into open peer review very quickly because I wanna get to the data uh, before we finish up. So for those of you who don't know, um, open peer review uh, is a bit of a touchy topic because it's, 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 it's not black and white on whether it's open or closed. But essentially what we have in academia is, is a, a blinded system, single blind, double blind and so forth, where authors typically submit a, a first draft of their article to an editorial board. Um, and then essentially that is either immediately rejected because it doesn't fit, or if it looks like it, it, it uh, isn't, uh, uh, if it applies for that journal or is fit for the journal, then it will get sent to peer review. That means that the authors and the reviewers then uh, could be blinded. So sometimes the author, the author's name will be withheld or not, or the reviewer's names will be held or not. Typically, it's a double blind system where the reviewer doesn't know who's writing and the uh, author doesn't know who's reviewing. Now, of course, it's not that simple. In a small field, you have a good idea who's going to review you. Uh, you will all probably already know by the way the article is written and what they're writing about who the author is. But for argument's sake, it's essentially uh, uh, blinded or closed. And typically on top of that, there is a peer review report which goes to the editorial board and the author, but it is usually not opened. So we usually only see the output of this result in a publication. We typically never see who was involved in the publication uh, review and what the actual review said. Now, open peer review is trying to push more towards opening up several of these components. Uh, in other words, opening up the publication process. So typically what we have in, in the current system is review first, publish second, and open peer review is trying to turn that backwards. Publish first, review second. In other words, in an extreme line, so not everything needs to be extreme, but if I take the extreme, an article is published online first, it then goes to peer review. The author's name is already there clear and you can see it. The peer review uh, reviewers are assigned. You can see who they are and then you can see their comments on the review, either live or delayed. And then, of course, the uh, author can respond because typically it's not perfect, never perfect. So the author can respond, it goes to a second version, uh, and then perhaps it's accepted, or maybe it goes to a third version. So opening up the entire peer review process. Now, I've just heard that um, you use, or, or at least they would like to use some a similar system in uh, Israel. So I'm gonna just give an example of this, and this is the F1000 model, Faculty 1000 Research this is. And this is essentially a new type of publishing platform. It is not a journal as such. There's no such thing as a journal here. This is what they call a mega journal. So what they do is articles are submitted according to topics, and then they are basically aligned under specific domains or subdomains or subtopics. So no journal per se, but rather, um, what do they call it here? I think they call it gateways. So the example you have on the screen here is an article about peer review, a bit meta, by uh, Tony Ross Heller. Now, this is, is grouped into the collection of articles called science policy research. So they call this here a gateway, comparable maybe to a journal, but it is not a journal. It is not a frequently published uh, uh, journal that comes in cycles and so forth. It's just simply deposited on the platform. Now, what you see here is that, first of all, you notice that there's versions. There's two versions here. So Tony submits version one. That is the draft. It's published on the platform and accepted and it's automatically now available to everybody. It's a preprint. Then what happens is there are uh, referees assigned. You can see them, one, two, three, four. 
And if you look down on the right there, you can actually even see who they are linked to their ORCID accounts. So now you can see who is reviewing this article. Uh, that makes, of course, conflicts apparent or not. It also shows you, of course, who's interacting with who, which is more interesting for analytics. Um, and you can see here in the first version that three, uh, sorry, let me scroll down here, that four of them reviewed, one accepted, three had question marks. So this was rejected. Uh, I think to get accepted, it needed three, um, three, let's say, green lights for it to go ahead. What this means is that Tony is sent back to the drawing board. He gets comments. The comments are actually available. You can click and see what they said about the article. And then Tony revises this. He can respond to the comments publicly, which he has done, and he republishes. So we get to version two. Now, the first reviewer accepted it, so that person is now gone. And then we see the other three have checked. Has Tony taken the comments into account? And in this case, after the second version, they've accepted it. So you see now three green ticks at the top. So this article is now ready for publication, has been accepted, and is put there. So you see an entirely open process of who submitted the article, what article was submitted, who reviewed it, what they said, how it was responded to, and how it was finally got there at the end. This is a, an extreme open version. You can also see metrics here, such as views and downloads. Um, I'm not saying I fully espouse this. There are reasons where I think some parts of this process should not be open. We know that many early career researchers do reviewing for their seniors or supervisors. Um, and we also know that some fields are not as friendly as we would like. So an early career researcher uh, publicly reviewing a senior prominent researcher is probably not going to be good for their career, especially if it's somewhat critical. So there are reasons to not fully be open here. But nevertheless, F1000 has put forward this fully uh, open model. I check if there's comments or questions before I jump on. I, I have a arms. question. Yep. What happens if it's not uh, if it's uh, rejected completely? Good question. The second time to. Good question. I, I don't know actually if this can go on forever until it gets accepted. Um, I, I My guess is if it's outright rejected, there is a record of what was rejected, but that's it. It doesn't go forward in this platform. But we have to be careful now about what we what we're talking about to be accepted means. So F1000 does not distinguish, um, and rightly so in my view, between, um, let me watch the word I use now, um, good versus bad sites. So it does not make that distinction. It makes a distinction between methodologically sound science and methodologically unsound science. In other words, if this, if this research report conforms to scientific standards, if it sets hypotheses that are tested, if the methodology is correct, regardless of the outcome, it will be accepted. It will only be rejected if it is not methodologically sound. In other words, it's not uh, good science practice. So what they are not saying is that this is an excellent article, or this is an interesting article, or this is a relevant article. They simply say it's a methodologically sound article. So if the article is rejected, it means it's not methodologically sound. That's it. What this, the reason for this is, is very clear. It, they do not want to act as a gatekeeper for science per se, but strictly a gatekeeper on what is good methodologically sound science. In other words, if you have negative results, you will get published because you followed the scientific process. If you have research that's really not interesting at all, you will get published. If you're simply a reproducibility study, you will get published. Now, what they do is on top of that, they add a typical secondary layer to identify highly interesting, highly relevant articles. But critically at that level, it's if it is methodologically sound or not. And the reason for that, I hope, is obvious. A lot of research is rejected and is not published because it's not considered sexy or it's not considered important, or it's boring, or it's negative results. And as a consequence of this, huge amounts of money is wasted on this research that gets done, but it's not shared. And as a result, we end up repeating the same negative, boring results, because we don't know what's out there. And the researchers themselves don't get rewarded for it, because they don't publish their negative results. They don't publish their boring research. Or rather, it doesn't get accepted. So this model is a drive towards 
methodologically sound science where we have a track record of the research been done and the outcomes, and that's there for posterity archived. I see two hands, one may be an old hand. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I think it's a little bit premature for you as well, to use yep. the, this open peer review. And that's the reason we don't have too many publication in our F1000. Does it catch you in, in Europe? Do, people, do researchers publish in F1000? So, um, so first of all, we have to we have to make be clear what it is. It's a platform, and uh, it's not a journal per se. It's a platform that they run for journals, right? So they run this for I think it's the Wellcome Foundation, um, and now the Open Research Europe platform from the European Commission also runs on this same model. So the yeah. idea from the Commission and Wellcome, the Wellcome Trust, is very simple. All the research that we spend is not getting published. And what they want is they want a, a platform where researchers on their funding can get out their results, even if they know it will never get accepted in a top journal, right? That's not the point. The point is to get the research results out. So the European Commission supports um, this new platform built on F1000 called Open Research Europe. And the idea there is that as a researcher in a commission project, you can publish your results as long as they're methodologically sound. Uh, you don't have to pay an APC and you'll be guided through the publication process in one of these mega journals. So this so, is not a vision, this is a buy side. It's, it's been taken up by some funders, but the real critical issue is twofold here. Uh, I think that full extreme openness here is a bit too much for most researchers, um, but I do think it's good that we at least put it out there and try it and see where it goes wrong, such as with early career researchers, that should be made clear, and then we need to make exceptions. And the second thing is um, that it's, it, it is being supported by some funders strictly as an outlet to get research results out. So they know it's not going to be the uh, uh, platform of choice to publish. But that's the point. It's the second option. It's plan B. When you can't get published anywhere else because it's negative, not interesting, uh, not, not topical, you can publish here. So, so note, that we, we make a distinction between the platform and the obligatory openness. Not all elements here need to be obligatory, right? You could use the platform and choose for anonymous uh, of the name, or you could choose anonymity of the reviewers uh, or on anonymity of the comments, or perhaps even delay in when these things are opened, right? So maybe you don't see everything I'm showing you now, but one year, two years, three years after the publication is opened, maybe then the review reports come out and so forth. So I think there's we're in a, an experimentation period where we're playing uh, with what works and what doesn't work, you know? But if you ask me if this is being taken up, I would say not really. Researchers do not fully support this for obvious reasons, but the funders are now experimenting with it as a venue to get results uh, out. I see a hand. I'm yes. not sure if it's an old hand. Yes, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, it's a follow-up question. Uh, can this uh, platform be um used in the reverse it seems like a great idea to get comments and get your work reviewed mm. can you publish here and after that if you get a good comments and you revise your work publish in the journal no so um so let me separate two things here right um there are other platforms like what you're referring to now mm -hmm. in principle if it's published here as in accepted it won't get anywhere else because because okay. there's no journals going to accept it because this is a, a form of publication. Um, so, so that's typically what many preprints do, right? They yeah. put it out there, they get the input to publish it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that's not this. The idea here is you publish here full stop. Actually, by publishing it here, it's already published. The review comes later. You see what okay. I mean? Yeah, yes, yes. It's just not been fully peer reviewed, but of course, when it gets peer reviewed, it's fully here. So nature's not gonna take an, a top article that's been published here because it's nothing new. You can read the results elsewhere, right? Um, so, so really what's getting published in these platforms, in my view, is either um, uh, negative results, reproducibility results, less interesting results, articles that were rejected in many other journals, um, or, or those heavy advocates of open science that really believe in the method and put top articles out there. Some do. Uh, so it's not the case that none of it is interesting. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the case, but I am saying that researchers are, are using this as a secondary venue. 
Uh, and, and, and again, I think that's that's for obvious reasons. Now, there's no reason why such a platform couldn't be closed initially. There's no reason why you couldn't go through this entire process in the back end. Mm -hmm. And then after acceptance, agree to open parts of it, maybe the name, right, obviously, and the title, maybe the reviewers, or delay it by one year or two years. I mean, why should I care what I said about Professor X five years later or three years later, you know? Um, now we say that thinking of social media where people are called up on tweets from 10 years ago, right? So uh, there has to be an, an element of caution there, I think. Okay. Um, I just check, we're, we're coming up to 10 o'clock. Do you want me to stop on time or do you want me to go on even for 15 more minutes? I don't mind. I think it's okay. I think it's okay that you can continue yeah. 15 minutes more. Okay, then I will uh, get to the, some of the more touchy topics, which is the data. Um, okay, so I, I, I'm not going to assume people know these, this acronym or the difference between open and fair, uh, but I will make the distinction here. So open data, in my view, is opening up a data set. Uh, there may or may not be standards. Basically, I could dump any data set out there uh, online and it's considered open data and it could be completely useless because you won't know what's in the data set or the format not, not comply with standards um, or you may not be able to do anything with it if I have it encrypted. So open data uh, is a bit of a question mark. Now, what we're pushing towards in, in Europe and in the United States now to more extent is what we call fair data. Now, the, the acronym uh, in the United States is used somewhat differently. And that might give you a clue where we're going with this. And that is fully AI ready. However, in Europe, we talk about the principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Now, critically, the FAIR principles are protocols or, or standards or principles for metadata. In other words, it is the information you give about the data set that is critical. And the reason for that is that we have got, we have essentially already passed the point where humans can access data. We already have far too much publications in our fields to be able to read. And we've already surpassed the ability of a human to go through data sets within their own domain, subdomain, subtopic. So the way forward here is clearly through machines. I'm not talking about artificial intelligence right now. There's no machine that's intelligent. Uh, they, they, they do certain things, but they're certainly not clever. So I'm talking about machine learning right now. And what we have is um, essentially a way through the FAIR principles to make data machine actionable. So when I talk about FAIR, I mean machine actionability. A machine knows what's in my data set it knows what it can do with it, and it knows what I mean. Now, the depth of information I put in there will make it even more useful or less useful for the machines. But critically, fair data is a minimum set of standards um, for machines to be able to understand what to do with this data set. Now, just to be clear here, fair does not mean open. I can have a data set that is fair, but closed because I know about the data set doesn't mean I can gain access to it. I can have an open data set that is not fair. So typically what you would want is a data set that is made fair and immediately or later on made open, if possible. And we can come back to that. So the fair principles look like this. Uh, I don't expect you to know them or read them. Uh, and it's very difficult to do. I've made my own data sets fair over 10 years ago. I needed two data stewards, professionals to help me do this because it is just not simple. Um, so in principle, even for researchers, unless you're using a simple interface like Zenodo, um, it's not an easy thing to do. So I think tools need to be put in place for this and definitely support in the form of, for instance, a data steward needs to be uh, uh, put at the university. Now, what these protocols basically do is they tell you how to find something. So where can I find this, this data set? Where is it located? Um, is there a specific identity code I can use to track it? It's accessible. It doesn't mean it is accessible. It means I know how to gain access to it. I know if there is a specific 
um, access level. For instance, maybe it's for everybody, or maybe it's only for team members, or maybe it's only for specific individuals with a top secret clearance at a, at a government, for instance. But accessibility is telling the machine who can get access, how they can get access, and what they can actually get access to. And the protocols around that are clear for everybody. Interoperability means that the systems can talk to each other. So if I have it located in one particular uh, repository, it is able to connect to another. And by extension, I can find it online and it becomes more findable. So interoperability here is about how data sets can be compared and how they can communicate with each other, essentially. And reusability, what I'm allowed to do with it. So again, top right hand corner of the slide, this, the reusability of this uh, slide set is that you can do whatever you want with it. You can copy it, you can change it, you can sell it. However, you do need to put my name somewhere. So I, I give you ultimate freedom to do whatever you want with my slides. I simply ask that you use my name so that people know where the original came from. So reusability, what can I do with this? Now, why uh, would we want data to be made fair? Well. The answer is, is quite simple. What we're trying to build now in Europe is uh, not just to make a data set findable and I can go see where it is. Critically, what we're trying to make is a federated web of fair data. So if you can imagine the internet which connected hypertexts through links, what we're trying to, to build essentially is an orthogonal type of internet of data. So the protocol that the data sets communicate and agree upon is FAIR, similar to the uh, IP TCP protocol for the net. And here the idea is that by connecting all of these data sets in a standard language, the FAIR principles, researchers can gain access to an enormous web of data out there. But now let me take a little step forward. They can use services that are out there on the data, critically machine learning, and in the future AI algorithms. Now, why would this be interesting? Well, I can already not find and uh, understand the data sets that are out there for linguistics, but a machine can. So I can ask a machine to go do a search and it will be able to scan the whole web of data and pull out what it needs, depending on how deep the descriptions are. It may even be able to access the data sets, but it goes beyond that. It's not just about looking at what's there in linguistics, but it's about drawing correlations between those data sets, across those data sets, pulling out correlations I never would have seen as a human being. On top of that, it's beyond linguistics. If these are data points, the machine can connect linguistics to biology, to climate, to physics, you name it, and start pulling out correlations we never expected. Now, an example is a colleague of mine in, uh, in America published a very sensitive article, linguists were, uh, up in anger with this rubbish, uh, even though he had proved you know, the correlations and causation. And what he said was that if you are living in an arid, dry environment, you are more likely to produce click sounds like ah, 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 ah. Now, the reason for this in his head was very simple. In these environments, which are highly arid in the desert, you of course want to save as much liquid as possible, meaning you don't want to use sounds that spit water, like p, f, l, m. And so you use sounds that don't use water, that use a clicking mechanism. Now, he showed this uh, in an article with evidence to back it up. Point being here, this was, of course, something that Caleb himself thought of and proved, but the machine would have found those correlations. The machine would have also found correlations that if your country has acacia trees, uh, you make sounds which are lips. Zero, there is definitely a correlation, zero correlation. So what we have is in the future, and that's what we're going to get to in the next slide, we will have a web of data where the data sets are understandable because they're all translated into the FAIR principles. Machines can access them, understand what's there, dig down into them, correlate within disciplines, and critically correlate across disciplines to propose to us, the humans, uh, what correlations look interesting or not. And ultimately then it's for the humans to go dig deep into the science and prove the causation. So let's take an example in the future of a federated web of data uh, through, for instance, the European Open Science Cloud. 
So let's say in the future, we have this data, federated data set connected, and I type into a simple search engine, malaria, please tell me more. The machine goes and does an immediate analysis of all articles tagged for malaria. It will pull out, let's say 100,000 articles, and it will be able in the future to extract the key components of those articles. And what it will tell me is, it looks like malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. 95%, maybe in 5%, it says malaria is transmitted by chocolate cake. Fine, the machine statistically will rule that out, but of course we can probably figure out that it's not related to chocolate cake or there's some other comorbid factor we probably should investigate. But it doesn't stop there, it starts digging. It takes what it's got from the articles, it takes the keywords, it takes mosquitoes, malaria, and now it goes left and it goes into data, public databases of where there have been outbreaks of malaria in the recent past, at least where we have the data for this. And it starts identifying on a map and the time of year, specifically, where these malaria outbreaks occur. It then takes the information it has from the map and it goes to the Copernicus satellite imagery stored over a decade and starts looking at the, the map where these things occur. And it notes that in the time frame it occurs or in the temperature frame or the humidity frame, we get these results. In other words, malaria happens in these places at this time, in this temperature range, with this humidity range, with this water level range, with this air pressure range. And now it's already building a picture of what malaria potentially is, where it occurs, when it occurs, what are the contributing factors. It goes into the databases from the hospitals or the chemical databases, and it starts looking at what chemicals or medicines were sold or were not sold or did not do well in that same time frame in those particular countries. And it starts listing potential medicines already in effect. It then lists the medicines, goes into a chemical structure database and starts pulling out the active components linked to potential uh, uh, malaria, anti-malarial use. The final consequence here is that it has not only pictured a full spectrum of malaria, where it occurs, what it potentially is, when it occurs, when it doesn't occur, how to stop it. It even proposes either existing chemicals used to combat it or potentially new chemical structures we never thought of. Now that's one search on malaria. It's probably done this in a matter of seconds, depending on how far into the future we are. And it has given me an enormous full spectrum picture of this problem. It is now for me as a scientist to filter out the rubbish, to get into the details of what it really is, where it occurs, when it occurs, how can I stop it? And maybe then very quickly, we can move to a treatment for this, uh, be that a social treatment or be that a chemical treatment. So this is an example uh, where I think ahead now 25 to 50 years of a fully federated web of data. Uh, and you can imagine that's just one topic I've picked. Now to close, let's see if there's any risks. Uh, now we, we, you've heard the word artificial intelligence. I, I won't use that word right now. I'm pretty sure machines will be intelligent in the future, but that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is stupid machines who can basically process enormous data sets. And for them to do that, they need to be able to access the data set and understand it. And the only way for them to do that is if we use the same language, the FAIR principles, and we use the same protocols and descriptions. So once that's in place, the machines can do the stupid work of going through the entire data sets, seeing what's out there, understanding what's out there, and drawing correlations between uh, potentially what we would see as humans as random data points, and then make a proposal to me, the researcher, to go dig into it. Now, when we look forward here, um, there's a couple of thing, factors that we need to take into account. First of all is we don't know what we don't know. So when Facebook came out, people started liking everything, liking book clubs, liking political movements, liking their friends, and nobody fully understood what Facebook was really doing. And what they were doing was analyzing human behavior, human networks, human responses. Critically, with a view to not just making money, but in the future, controlling, manipulating, uh, pushing or nudging human behavior. In other words, from all the material Facebook built up, 
we see that they could even now start interfering in election campaigns and nudging individuals to vote according to how they wanted. So this was the scandal with Cambridge Analytics, if several of you remember that going back. The point here is that we didn't know what they were doing at the time. We probably did not know the results of that. And we see now that it had huge behavioral consequences. So we don't know yet what the machines will find in a fully federated data set. Now, the Hoover there is essentially uh, a possible problem in the future. If we open up all data sets and publish them out there, anybody can gain access to it. Now, what that means is an entire data set can suddenly be copy pasted and somebody can merge it with theirs and build upon it. We don't know yet if that's a really good thing to do. The European Open Science Cloud pushed for open data sets and openness. And I mean open in the, in the extreme sense. And now we see discussions of backtracking where it's not clear if everything should be open or rather should be open to everyone. For instance, if some regions in the world, which I won't mention, are not playing very fair, do we want to be opening up potentially critical data uh, to these regions to be able to use and possibly abuse in the future? Now, another complication is what I said about dual use technology, civil and military use. We, in principle, will not publish dual use technologies. There's a filter there. It will not get published. You will not be reading about uranium enrichment procedures and machines online for obvious reasons that anybody could then take this to develop a nuclear weapon. However, we do publish components of research that on the surface look unharmful or benign or beneficial. We don't know in the future if on a federated data set where there are many, many, many different types of these components out there, if a clever machine would be able to either A, rebuild parts of that and get to the final solution there, or B, recreate, uh, for instance, uranium enrichment or even weaponize the data out there. We simply don't know. So this is a, a potential problem we have where the consequences of opening up billions of data sets across disciplines, in principle, not for dual use technology, could ultimately, through an extremely smart algorithm in the future, lead to dual use uh, technological uses. We just don't know. And that's something I believe that we have to keep an eye on. And the final one, um, and I make a joke here with Skynet, but possibly it's not a joke, is ultimately to build and develop a real artificial intelligence system. And I mean now a super intelligence. Uh, I don't mean Superman, but I mean an intelligence that goes way beyond humans with way beyond our capacity for processing, understanding and foresightful thinking. Uh, ultimately, an, a, an extremely clever system like this will need a data source. Now we have the internet out there, but of course that's not uh, always a good place to go. We know that when, um, I don't remember the name of the company, it escapes me now, but this company was developing a, a bot to behave like a human and talk like a human. And so what it did was it released this bot to learn across the internet. And when it, it came back with its result and it started talking, they had to shut it down because it turned out it was a white, uh, angry racist. And the reason for that was it had gone to chat rooms, of course, which is the majority of a lot of interactions online, where there's a lot of angry people, apparently. And it had basically taken characteristics from these chat rooms and ended up as a really horrible person. So they had to kill this bot. Uh, so my point there is maybe the Internet is not going to lead to super intelligence, but a federated data set of billions of data with huge potential for learning scientific advancement could potentially lead to development of a super intelligence. And what we know is one thing. The moment this superintelligence arises, it will have a supreme supremacy over other intelligences or even other machines out there. So again, consequences here are far reaching. I'm talking way into the future now, 50 beyond 50 years. But these are things I think that we need uh, to keep into account. I'm going to stop there, see if there's any questions or comments uh, before we wrap up. Uh, I have a question. Who is going yeah. to monitor this huge database and make sure that, in order to make sure that nobody uses it for, you know? Yeah. 
So this is not on the table right now. What's on the table right now is how do we make a data set fair? How do we connect repositories? How do we offer data online? How do we offer services online? We, at the moment, we are so focused on making it possible to get there. This is a much later uh, uh, problem, if you see what I mean. This is not on the table. So who would look for that? I don't know. Who, who manages the internet, right? Critically, what you will have in the European Open Science Cloud, but it's not the only one. There's a cloud in America. There'll be a cloud in China, in Brazil. There's going to be African an African Open Science Cloud. You will see lots of these different clouds arising gradually. Um, and remember, these are the public clouds. There will, of course, be military clouds, governmental clouds, which will copy paste all of them so they have an even bigger data set, right? Plus their own confidential data. So at least for the European Open Science Cloud, the gatekeeper here will be the institutional repositories. That's where the data will be put, institutional or thematic uh, repositories. They will act as the gatekeepers. In most cases, they will probably just check if the data is fair so that it conforms to standards. Um, but critically, will it look at the quality of the data or the content? I don't know. I'm sure a flag will be risen if the name of the data set is uranium enrichment. But if it's not as obvious, then I'm not sure who would be checking. And remember, the problem here that I'm, I'm highlighting is not that you would know that a particular data set is a problem. It's not. A single data set is not a problem, right? A finger is not a human. But if I have all the other components out there, it's just a matter of somehow reassembling or recreating it, right? Um, so it could be the case in the future that we have essentially machine machine intelligence systems combating each other, right? You do a scan with a machine intelligence to see what's out there. It flags certain combinations and we'll have to pull them or restrict them or so forth. So possibly in the future, the answer will be, we open up as much as we can, but there are restrictions on access and they could potentially be pulled. Now, let me make a, a final point on open and fair data. A fair data set can be closed, but useful. So remember, a human may not get access to a data set. So let's say I have a biomedical data set where no human will ever get access to it, but an algorithm might be allowed get access. An algorithm might be allowed go in, perform operations, and then extract the results of those operations. Now, assuming that it's a trusted data set and there are protocols in place for you to know it's a trusted data set and what's in there, but you never, you never yourself as the researcher gain access, you've not broken uh, safety, confidentiality sensitivity laws, and you have managed to actually do something with the data set, you've extracted results. So fair does not mean open. And it could be the case here where some data sets are fair, but not open, but certainly are machine actionable. And before the data is extracted, there could be a firewall in place to double check what's actually being extracted and uh, what the result of that operation is, if that makes sense. Okay, I just check if there's any other questions. I seen a question on who is eligible to deposit data in EOSC. To be very honest, EOSC is a big word right now. Um, in principle, any researcher is able to deposit data. I can go to Zenodo right now. If you don't know, please go check Zenodo, it's fantastic. I can put a data set in there. It makes me fill in specific questions and they are essentially metadata fields that are conform to FAIR. So it forces the researcher in a simple way to fill in the metadata description, and then it opens up the data set so you can actually access it, see who's been involved and see the usage and so forth. Um, so in principle, if you deposit a data set in an institutional repository that is fair, you are basically part of EOSC or would or could be part of EOSC in the future. But that comes back to the institutional repository, what data you're depositing and what standards you've complied with for that to be deposited in the institutional repository. My guess is that in the future in Europe, uh, institutional thematic data repositories will all conform to FAIR standards, um, where the researcher probably won't even have to know what FAIR means. They'll just simply put their uh, data set somewhere, they'll be asked to fill in some questions, and that's it. It goes into the big federated web of data. So ultimately here, a main question is what does the researcher really need to know? And in some cases, they may not even need to know what EOSC or FAIR is. They just simply need to put their data somewhere, uh, fill in the relevant metadata fields, and then critically gain access to a data set without needing to know all the background. 
An example, in a way, could be Adarome. Many researchers know what Adarome is because they use it to get access when they travel, but nobody knows how it works. They don't know that there's an authentication and authorization uh, interface and pro set of protocols in the background and that there's calls happening at institutional and national and European global levels. They just know that Adarome works and they click a button. So probably in the future for FAIR, it will be the same. We don't really need to know something is FAIR. Now we do because we're in this transition to FAIR, to openness. But I think when this is more standard, people will not care about F, A, I, and R. And I think I'll stop there. We've gone a bit over time. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow during the day, we are going to have an happening and we are going to be there and answer questions about where to upload and how to get access and so on. So you're all welcome to the library and ask questions about open science, open access, and open data. And nice. Thank you very much, Garrett, for a very interesting and right. informative uh, talk. You started with the introduction to open science and ended up like uh, future science or imaginary uh, reality. Right, and I don't think, maybe we don't need to worry about it just yet. Maybe I worry a little bit prematurely, but certainly down the road, if you look broader at what the capabilities of such a system will be, there are potential issues that we need to address, right? Yeah, Individually you know, they, and collectively. There is a phrase in Hebrew, they say, the golem kamal yotso. You, you create something and then it, it like... Overcome over, you. Yeah. And it leads a life of its own. I think that's what yeah, we have to hear. It's be... like the internet. We had no idea where it would go and look where we are now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so and, we should be careful positive. today. Yeah, but also negative, right? Like these chat rooms. There are some negative issues that we need to face on the internet as well. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there's, I think there's two last slides on citizen science so people can click the buttons there. There's some nice examples of uh, citizen science if you're interested. We have a lecture about citizen science during Tomorrow. the week, so you're all welcome nice. to join. Thank you. Well, thank you for the talk and for thank the invitation. So and good luck with your open, uh, your open science group, your open access group. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.